You mentioned types of food, and we haven't really made it clear yet what hyperpalatable foods look like. And I think people could probably, uh, you know, have a have a guess. But it might be that people are thinking it's just the colorful packaged foods in the grocery stores are hyperpalatable foods just this kind of majority of ultra processed foods or could we be creating these hyperpalatable foods in our kitchen unknowingly are our favorite restaurants making them and and so we're going out for, for dinner and being exposed to these types of foods pretty much all of the above <laughs> so the um the the piece that really struck me when I started doing this work and I've seen as such a compelling pattern in the in the data sets that we analyze is that the types of foods that are hyper palatable are often foods that are not necessarily on people's radar in a way of being like, oh, you know, I bet that's hyper palatable. Like, okay, you can tell, you know, you're not really telling me something that I don't already know, you know, like this Oreo or like, you know, the, there are like some easy go-to items that people are like, oh, you know, if I go to a, you know, a fast food place or, you know, the, so, so what the definition is, is able to kind of do, I think is, is highlight that a lot of our food supply in terms of like the main meals that we consume are the ones that have elevated fat and sodium. Um, fat and sodium hyper palatable foods are like, um, are the most common type of food wow. in our food supply. I think that'll be surprising because yes. most people would, I assume, would first point to sugar. Yes. And in the literature as well, right? Um, there's been a lot of focus on like desserts, sweet items, things like that. But when we we took a data driven approach to when I started this area of work to you know try to define like what are these to begin with, um, I was surprised to see sodium pop up. Like it's in two of the three types of foods, and so I thought that that was curious, and it's been an extremely reliable finding, and. And an, a very interesting thread that has kind of pulled through this work that I've been conducting over five years now. And so, you know, fat and sodium hyperpalatable foods are things like, you know, um, main entrees, like meat, a lot of meat based dishes, um, you know, are a lot of, um, you know, some breakfast items that are like savory that we might make at home or we might go to a restaurant and eat. So like an omelet cooked with, um, you know, like, let's say all kind of more whole ingredients, like throw in some vegetables and some meat, like bacon and cheese and, you know, butter, or olive oil and salt. And before you know it, um, you know, the, the, that may end up being fat and sodium hyper palatable. And so a lot of the stuff that we consume, um, you know, is 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 in our meals and in like our appetizers as well. Yeah, I've um, I've got quite a few <laughs> friends who are chefs. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> I I learned a long time ago that their secret weapon and they call it SOS: salt, oil, sugar. <laughs> sprinkle that. <laughs> hey, there you go. <laughs> sprinkle that on any dish. Put that into a marinade, into a sauce, into a salad dressing, and it it makes just about anything taste good. Uh, what is it? about this combination of ingredients that's affecting our reward centers in a different way to if, if we just had a packet of salt here and we would eat salt by itself, mm -hmm. right? That's very rich in sodium, yes. but that's not exactly going to be something we're going to be compelled to, to keep consuming. Exactly. So what's going on here when you combine fat with sodium or carbohydrates with mm -hmm. sodium that changes that yeah so the the you know fat and carbohydrates like they you know we we know that like these these types of ingredients um you know can activate um you know our our blood glucose particularly the carbohydrates right um and um they can affect our glucose responding which then connects directly to the dopamine reward neurocircuitry there's an interesting thing about sodium um or table salt, is that salt, uh, sodium can engage the opioid system. 
Um, yeah, <laughs> so which is the same that is is engaged by other, right. you know, um, oxy content. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so that can, and and also sugar to the point of like the SOS for the cooks that you mentioned from some of your chefs. Um, sugar also does that. I just outed a lot of chefs. I realize. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, friends. <laughs> so so there, there's something interesting about that. And there have and and the the literature has, in my kind of opinion and experience of having been in this area a little while, like really pretty dramatically overlooked sodium. Um, I think it is because, you know, we think about the things, the ingredients that can directly contribute to calories, which is fat and carbohydrates. The the amount of sodium that we put in anything is not going to contribute a substantial amount of calories, right? So I think it's an easy thing to kind of overlook, but when added to something, um, you know, can really make us consume quite a bit more of it. There were, um, there were, I found a few studies when I looked at this a while ago that, um, you know, used some like experimental lab studies where they fed, um, um, they fed, I think it was children like pasta dishes with varying levels of, um, fat and sodium. And they found that like just adding more sodium increased their cons- consumption of that pasta meal by like 30%. So what's happening there from a biological point of view, evolutionary point of view, clearly there's some type of specific nutrient sensing to sodium that's saying to our body, eat more of that. Mm-hmm. Why? Yeah, I mean, like, we need a a certain amount of sodium, you know, like, for our bodies to, like, function properly and healthily and things like that, right? So, so I think that's part of it. But I also think that there's, there's quite a bit that, like, we, we aren't really sure about yet. And because I think sodium has, has, like, not been examined from the role of, like, how does it make people overeat? Like, we know that, you know, sodium, people need a certain amount. Generally, when we look at the diets, like, you know, people in the U.S. consume way more, <laughs> you know, at a dietary level than they should. Um, but really thinking about sodium as one of these ingredients that can enhance our experience of palatability and kind of drive consumption is is something that I think, um, you know, is really we need to understand more about. Um, and, you know, that, that's kind of part of my interest and kind of my, um, uh, my interest going forward is because we have seen that like sodium seems to be doing something very reliable here and it's in the vast majority of foods in our food supply. And it's, I think it's a little bit of a sleeper agent. <laughs> right. Yeah. So it's, it's, I'm just thinking out loud here. It's an essential nutrient. Yeah. So it's important mm-hmm. that we have this drive to get it. Mm-hmm. And for our ancestors in let's say relative to today's environment, a sodium dilute environment, there's less sodium available per calorie. Mm-hmm. It may have made sense to have that this drive for sodium to reach oh, so however right. much they needed from an essential point of view. Yes, yes. Because if you consume but, whole foods, they typically right. don't have that much sodium. So one would need to right. probably work pretty hard. Right, and they wouldn't have necessarily needed to evolve to kind of have this threshold whereby once you have a certain level of sodium in your body, then that drive goes away because it would have had to have killed people. You know, that that sodium excess would have had to have literally killed people in order for that adaptation to to occur. So So this is super interesting. (laughs) 